Hello and good morning to everyone in our global communications community. Welcome to join the very first event of the Ethics Month. The Ethics Month is the month of February starting here and now. My name is Kia Haring. I have a role as a Director of Ethics and Standards at Global Alliance for PR and Communication Management. And the Ethics Month is an activity organized by Global Alliance. I will be your moderator during this webinar today. About the ethics and ethics month and ethics in communications, why does it matter? The latest research states that the main strategic issue for communications for the next years is to build and maintain trust across key stakeholders. The economic turbulence related to the global pandemic has put trust to the test and is actually strengthening this trend. So the momentum to put emphasis on ethics in communications and PR is here right now. Building and maintaining trust require not only responsibility in actions, but also openness and transparency in all interactions and communications driven by moral and values with hon honesty, fairness and integrity as a foundation. The Global Alliance Ethics Month in February 2022 brings attention to the importance of ethics in communications in all areas of business, government, non-profit and education. It connects the PR and communications professionals globally to discuss the current state of ethics and the ethical dilemmas we as professionals face in our daily work. So welcome to join the Trust in Media webinar with us today. A big thank you to our local communication association PROCOM who has made this webinar happen. I hope you have filled in the brief survey that was sent to you together with the registering. If not, you still have time to do that. We will take a sneak peek to the results uh, during this session. Uh, in social media, please use the hashtags Ethics Matter or Ethics Month so that we can all follow the discussion even afterwards. You can use the chat function on this team chat to, for sending in your questions and we have plenty of time for those at the end of this session. So without further ado, I am happy to pre present you our speakers of today. And here they are. So welcome Chiara Valentini, Professor of Corporate Communication at Jyväskylä University School of Business and Economics from Finland. And Mark Badham here with me in the studio, a senior lecturer from the same university. As Chiara and Mark will be opening up their research on trust in media, we will have also Eero Hyvönen joining us uh, the Chair of the Council for Mass Media in Finland to give a commentary after the research uh, results has been disclosed. But now, without further ado, over to you, Mark. Thank you, Kia. So our topic is uh, trust in media during the COVID pandemic. A very interesting topic, I hope that you agree. And we're going to focus on the implications of that for us communication professionals. So welcome. Uh, let me start by saying that um, uh, COVID has challenged many of us to think about trust in the news media. I think uh, we all agree with that. For instance, we want everyone to follow COVID guidelines so that we can all contain the spread and uh, stay safe. But many do not trust the media, we think, uh, to, as the key channel of information uh, from governments and health authorities and so on. So this raises questions, doesn't it? So if this key information channel is distrusted, then uh, where do we turn for reliable, authority, accurate COVID guidelines? So first, uh, in our talk, uh, we will begin with a look at levels of public trust globally. Then uh, we'll have a quick look at why does all this matter? Why is media trust important for us communication professionals and for society? And then we'll begin to present key findings 
from our COVID communication research project and Chiara will talk to you about that. And then later we'll move on with Kia to a discussion of uh, how does this impact us communication professionals and so on. So let's begin with uh, what is trust? Trust is, uh, it's always good to start with a definition, right? It's your willingness to be vulnerable to the actions of another person or entity or institution. For instance, the media. And it's based on the expectation that that person or entity or institution will perform a particular action that's important to you, despite your inability to control that action. We've adapted that definition from Mayer and colleagues 1995. So trust in media, the global comparisons. Um, we base this largely on the Reuters Institute Digital News Report, the most recent one, 2021. And we see that trust in media, this may surprise many of us, trust in media actually grew during the, this pandemic by 6% globally on average. This actually reverses the recent decline in trust. Average was 44% trust globally. But we found that it was highest in Finland, go Finland, 65% uh, and lowest in the USA, which may not be that surprising, 29%. Let's start looking at some of the regions and countries where you might be having joined us. So Finland is at the top with 65%. Uh, we're representing uh, the, the Nordic perspective, and so we're focused on Denmark and Norway and Sweden and so on. And you can see they're, they're, they're still pretty high. Uh, UK is at 36% in that Northern Europe region, so quite low. Then we look at Western Europe and Southern Europe. France, particularly low, and Greece, particular, particularly low. Some of you may be surprised, I don't know, but Portugal, 61%, almost as high as Finland. Then we go to Eastern Europe, Poland, the highest at 48, Hungary, the lowest. North America, there we see USA again, compared to Canada at 45, a big difference there. And uh, the next Asia Pacific section there, I'm from Australia, and it's kind of in the middle there, it's the average around 43, 44%. So the Reuters Institute looked at media trust in three different measures or variables. They looked at uh, perceptions of media fairness and they tried to gauge public opinion about fairness of the media. And they found that uh, the media is seen to be fairly representing, uh, uh, for instance, younger people particularly uh, felt that they aren't fairly represented in the media, uh, which is unfortunate. But also, and this is probably not surprising, that those on the right of the political spectrum uh, tend to feel that the media aren't, the mainstream news media aren't uh, representing them fairly. The second measure that the Reuters Institute looked at was this perception of impartiality, so impartial and objective news. And they found that three quarters uh, of the population globally prefer news that reflects a range of views and lets them decide what to think. Not, and there's not much variation across the countries. They're all pretty uniform with that three quarters. And then 66%, a little bit lower, uh, think that media should try to be neutral on every issue. And then the minority found that uh, they felt that it makes no sense to try to be neutral on some issues. Uh, so that was a minority. Then the third measure they looked at was uh, con concerns of misinformation. They looked at a number of different measures, but I'm just focusing on these three. So concerns of misinformation, the average was close to 60% globally. And that was, that's been the same roughly for the last few years. But the highest concern was in Africa and the lowest in Europe. So that might be interesting to some of you. So now why does all this matter? Um, why does media trust matter, whether it's going up or down, whether we perceive it highly or not? So the news media is at the center of what we call the supply chain of information about, for instance, COVID guidelines. Um, 
for instance, let's look at governments. And you, a lot of you, some of you may be communication professionals working in governments. Um, for you, uh, you, turn, you turn to the media as a reliable channel, and we need to have media as a reliable channel of our information, particularly during a crisis like this pandemic. For citizens and businesses, uh, we rely on media as a source of accurate and reliable information. Citizens might say, well, if we can't trust the media during a crisis for accurate information and truthful information, who can we trust? And that's a serious matter. But then for all audiences, during a crisis, a pretty big crisis, and especially a global one, we rely on the media as a sense maker uh, of complex uh, information uh, that's, that's being supplied to us. And uh, it's during a crisis that we tend to want someone out there to make sense. And the news media traditionally has been that sense maker. So this is why you know, trust in media is important. So for organizations, businesses, uh, they rely on the media as a third party validator. So this is another reason why media trust is important because um, audiences tend to uh, rely on a third party to give an objective view of corporate messages. So if they read or listen to or view messages from a corporation, they tend to trust it more if it's coming from a third party validator and particularly the news media. So during a crisis, uh, citizens are more reliant on the media. Um, uh, and, and that's just something that we need to talk about, hopefully, in this, in this session, in the webinar. Um, so media trust is important for citizens to remain calm, to remain knowledgeable and uh, compliant, really, um, in crisis events. So, Chiara, over to you to talk about our project. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Good morning from Uvascula. Um, we're now moving to uh, some uh, real data, some, some findings from our project. Um, our project is still going on and it studies uh, essentially how different uh, <clears throat> social actors, organization, institutions are communicating about the COVID-19 and particularly we are also looking at the news media roles uh, during this pandemic uh, and, and how they're being treated, uh, the uh, different uh, voices or, or uh, social actors or <clears throat> communications uh, in, in their news coverage. Um, this is an international project which I'm leading and I'm working with Mark from my university, but also with uh, colleagues from the US, uh, Italy and South Korea. And it's a project sponsored by Helsinki Sanomat Foundation, which, which is a Finnish uh, uh, non-profit independent uh, foundation <clears throat> um, uh, granting a funding for research projects like the one we are doing. So we are very thank <clears throat> thankful to Helsinki Sanomat Foundation. Um, now, uh, moving to the, um, to the uh, project data. Uh, uh, <clears throat> um, just a second, yes. Right, the slides, next. Um, we were particularly interested in uh, looking at um, whether the news media coverage has impacted or influenced in the public attitude and the behaviors of citizens, in particular if they influence their coping mechanism. With coping mechanism, we, we mean uh, their <clears throat> uh, compliance to recommendations like uh, wearing masks, uh, social distance, keeping social distance, uh, um, today, now it's a time about uh, vaccinations. So, so all this kind of um, recommendation that uh, health authority has sent to the citizen. And how are they coping also emotionally uh, on the pandemic? Uh, we studied this in six different countries. Um, so beside Finland, we also uh, study Sweden, Australia, US, uh, um, uh, uh, um, South Korea and uh, Sweden. Uh, we collect data in uh, fall 2020, at the very end of 2020, and we are now collecting new data. Today, <clears throat> um, 
to um, a representative sample of the population in this country. So now I would like to <clears throat> present you some of the results which we find particularly interesting when it comes to uh, uh, um, the, um, the news media trust in the, in the uh, 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 pandemic. Um, we uh, look at uh, three different kind of uh, variables. So, so we look at, at uh, trust in the media in the terms of news credibility. Uh, we look at also at three uh, dependent variables, diversity of content, diversity of uh, source and opinion. Here particularly, we were looking at whether the journalists were giving space to a uh, different kind of uh, social actors, organization, institution, not the usual suspect we might expect the WHO, the health authorities or government. And also the, the angles, how they were discussing and presenting um, uh, information, news about COVID-19, so differences in opinion, um, <clears throat> which you might guess in democratic country, we expect that, of course, uh, the, the media to offer a fair balance of objective representation of uh, um, the situation. So giving visibility to a diversity of sources, a diversity of content and opinions. And then also we look at how uh, the um, population uh, um, perceived the quality of the information and whether this has uh, had an impact on what we call knowledge uncertainty, meaning uh, their uh, level of um, understanding or feeling to understand the, the situation. When we have high uncertainty about what's going on, we feel insecure, we feel uh, some form of stress, we feel um, maybe even confused and not knowing what to do about it. But if we have low uh, uncertainty, we are much more prepared to um, react or to at least to know what to do in case of crisis, in case of emergency. So we were interested to Lee, it does it matter if citizens trust the media, if the media uh, offer different kind of content about COVID um, and different opinions, does not matter for how citizen feels about their knowledge on the pandemic, on the disease, and, and what does and what can we learn about that? So this is essentially our <clears throat> question we investigate in this part of the project. Now, I want to show you some results which uh, we found particularly interesting. So you can see now on the left side of the chart, uh, news credibility, which is the uh, <clears throat> variables we use to measure media trust. So the highest news uh, uh, credibility is the more trust the citizen shows on, on the uh, traditional news media. And as you can see, the highest uh, trust is given to uh, Australia news media with the 5.18. Um, as average score, and the lowest Italy with 4.45. The scale is from 1 to 7, uh, with 7 the highest level and 1 the lowest level. So they are all above the, the middle point, but uh, with some differences. Um, on the right side, you look at the data related to source diversity. This variable actually uh, indicates whether the citizen perceive that they are um, mainstream um, news media uh, offer visibility in the news coverage uh, to different actors, to different organizations, institutions. So, so it was a variety of, of uh, source of information. And here again, very interesting, you find uh, uh, Italy, despite the news credibility very low, that has um, uh, as highest as Australian, uh, the level of uh, news diversity perceived by the citizen, of course. Um, when we look at the opinion diversity and content diversity, we also find the interesting result here. We have uh, uh, again uh, Italy standing above the other countries in, co in terms of opinion diversity. So here we, when opinion diversity, we mean different um, perspective, different uh, views on uh, COVID uh, uh, information on the specific topic there. Um, so. Um, uh, it's not a surprise that there are different sources. They, uh, each source might have a very different kind of uh, uh, views on the on the on the topic. Uh, but uh, we found it that uh, uh, despite this high level of opinion diversity in Italy, 
uh, um, we have, uh, um, uh, and also, for example, in Finland, the content diversity uh, in Finland is much lower uh, uh, than other countries. What does it mean? It means that uh, um, during the time we were uh, looking at this, uh, uh, serving this data, so I should mention that this is related to uh, the first year of the pandemic, uh, um, people, uh, Finnish citizens perceived that the news media um, was not uh, covering much diverse content, much diverse topic re uh, related to COVID, but much uh, focused on the same kind of key message uh, <clears throat> without uh, giving more visibility or other issues. Um, what does this uh, um, mean in terms of uh, how the citizen uh, um, uh, perceived uh, the, um, their uh, knowledge, the overall knowledge of the pandemic. Well, <clears throat> we've seen that uh, um, countries which give higher visibility to different sources, who uh, cover different opinions, uh, um, uh, in those countries, citizens shows an overall um, higher level of uh, knowledge uncertainty, like Italy as you can see, standing above the other countries. So the Italians show to be a little bit more insecure about uh, uh, what to do and how to cope about the pandemic. Uh, and uh, uh, then, for instance, country where the diversity was lower. And I think this is a quite interesting result as such, because uh, uh, it's not what we normally would expect it. We wouldn't normally expect it that diversity brings fairness, a good representation, and would uh, increase the knowledge uh, uh, among uh, <clears throat> the audiences. But in a crisis situation, in a risk emergency situation, where also the level of knowledge uh, on the pandemic uh, is in evolution. And we have to remember that a year ago, we knew much less than we know today about COVID-19 and how it spread and the different <coughs> variants and so forth. So um, in these kind of uh, circumstances, uh, um, spreading or, or sharing different kind of views might actually be counterproductive. Uh, 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 for um, helping citizens to cope with the pandemic. So now, <clears throat> now I would like to move into some kind of key learning based on this data. And of course, we have much more data to show, but uh, I think it will be nice then to discuss uh, some of these key findings in relation to media trust that we do. Uh, <clears throat> for us, it's important to, um, to underline a few points, which you see also in the slides. Um, of course, uh, a certain level of um, distrust or let's say critical view towards uh, the media and what is presented there is important. Um, and of course, uh, we know that uh, diversity as idea, diversity of content, diversity of opinions, diversity of, of sources uh, uh, <clears throat> covered in news story is an important democratic principle, is important also to uh, <clears throat> for us as uh, readers, as viewers of uh, uh, news media content, it's important uh, to have this diversity to uh, evaluate, judge and also um, gain confidence on 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 uh, on uh, on what we 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 um, we hear about the pandemic, but we have seen from our research that uh, um, in certain circumstances, like we are facing this global pandemic, uh, in countries where media trust is high, so we, we we talk about all in those countries where media trust is generally very high. It is totally fine and could be even very effective strategy if media become a validator, uh, um, an amplifier of government recommendation, and if media as a gatekeeper also focus uh, on certain sources and give less, uh, um, let's say, less uh, uh, visibility to alternative sources, which might actually uh, <coughs> endanger uh, the understanding of uh, the situation uh, from a public perspective. Um, so we are now saying that the uh, media should actually serve the, 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 the other source of information itself. But what we're trying to say is that in a specific condition, the media role can be something more than uh, the traditional role we expected and can take a stand on deciding which kind of content uh, should be covered how often and which sources are uh, the credible one, the one who help release uh, 
the right information uh, for public for for maintaining public health. Um, with this one, I would like to close and uh, get back uh, uh, to the studio uh, for uh, the next speaker uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chiara, and thank you, Mark, for excellent insights. Very, very good insights for all of us. Trust in media during the COVID pandemic. And just a reminder to our online audience, so you have a chance to put forward your questions. So please use the chat window in the, in the Teams live session, and we will take your questions to Mark and Chiara at the end of, end of this webinar. Uh, but let's now invite our commentator, so Eero Hyvönen, Chair of Council of Mass Media from Finland, will come and comment on the insights that Mark and Chiara just presented. The stage is yours, Eero. Thank you, Kia, and hello, everybody. And thank you, Chiara and Mark, for an excellent presentation and a very thought-provoking one. To, to begin with, I, I have to say that uh, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm fully uh, comfortable with, with the notion of, of media uh, being, news media being uh, more uh, uh, in a collaborative mode during the time of crisis. I hope at least that didn't mean that, that core values like, like independence and accuracy and integrity were compromised because of, of this crisis, because there was no need for that, I think. So um, in the next nine minutes or so, I'll, I'll quote research, supporting some and adding to some points uh, Kiera and Mark just made. At the end, I'll touch lightly on the possible role, role code of ethics and media councils may have in building trust in media, media uh, tr trust in news media. So, uh, this is the first one. Uh, trust is something that is constantly negotiated in a soci democratic society. And when, when it comes to, to Finnish audiences, the research has found that uh, the single most defining characteristic of Finnish audiences is that, is that they are trusting yet simultaneously critical to what both legacy and social media. Uh, so uh, the attitude is similar, but there's a huge difference when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, trust. Uh, you've seen uh, some figures uh, describing the tr trust in news media, but here comes, uh, here comes some uh, charts on, on social media. So uh, the blue, blue line here shows the EU average for trust in social media. And the red line is uh, like the Finnish average for, for all of the population. You can see that it has been low to begin with and it's been declining. And that shows in, in some other perspectives also. Uh, what makes n Nordic countries together different from many other societies is that when it comes to when people are searching for news they tend to go directly to uh, the news media online sites and apps uh, on the left corner you can see uh, Nordic countries like Finland Norway Sweden and Denmark a bit more to the right and the, the blue line again is is the legacy news media's online usage uh, and uh, the oranges for social media. You can see that there is a huge difference there in, in the Nordic countries. And when we go to the reasons for high trust in news media, uh, a robust media system entailing independent journalism is needed and also uh, this is, uh, this is uh, something that has been debated in the years, but uh, the Finnish uh, study I'm, I'm, re I'm quoting here is, is of the opinion that a long-term commitment to media education in educational policies is important as well. And uh, uh, 
uh, all the Nordic societies are quite uh, small and have been at least homogeneous and con and Finland is especially consensus oriented society. Uh, and as we know, the de decline in trust in the media is often a reflection of broader distrust and divisions in society. So uh, where there is where, where there are divides, there's less trust. And as uh, Kira and Mark uh, presented earlier, uh, professionally produced uh, content uh, produced by an individual or organization that is acting in good faith is something that produces trust. The, the Finnish mainstream media uh, don't represent themselves as politically partisan, but, but politically neutral. So this means that they don't actively undermine trust in each other, like in, for example in the United States and in some other markets as well. And, and the GGR news report from uh, 2020 says also, the Finland country report says only, it says also that uh, professional in Finnish journalism is supported by the established position of Council for Mass Media. That, that is the organization I'm representing here. And uh, the point is that uh, the professional journalism is, is founded on some codes of ethics, uh, I think all the way in, in Western democracies. But how to convince the audience that this commitment is sincere? Well, uh, the media councils may be a means to that end. And in Europe, here you can see, we have an alliance, alliance of uh, independent press councils of Europe, and there are 31 members there. Some of these are uh, quite fresh and just developing their, their organization, but uh, quite, quite many of these are well established, like the Finnish one. Uh, that is the case in, in all of the Nordic countries. And I'll go briefly. I'll go briefly into, into the practical questions: how how the media council in Finland is is functioning. Much of this I'm saying goes as well for for Sweden, Norway, and and Denmark. Uh, so the main task of of council for mass media is, is to interpret good journalistic practice. And the second one is to defend freedom of speech and publication. So we are he not here, here to restrict the freedom of speech, but to defend it. Uh, and anyone can file a complaint if ethical codes have been breached. So anyone here in Finland. You don't have to be personally involved. Uh, and if uh, the Council for Mass Media issues a reprimand, the medium in question has to pu publish the whole resolution. You can see on the, on the right corner uh, part of the resolution that has been published. There's the news feed of that, uh, that uh, medium in question on the, on the far, far right, and then there is the resolution that goes on and on and on. So it's, it's, uh, it's quite hard to hide in, in some corner of the publication. And also other media run news stories on uh, our decisions, like the reprimand that was shown just uh, on the previous page, it was, pop it was covered by 22 news outlets altogether. Uh, and by far, the majority of Finnish news media, media is affiliated to the Council for Mass Media and an influencer part of other mainstream media also. And then also minor publications through their own association. So all this means 
that uh, the commitment to ethical codes is made visible. So, thank you. Thank you, Eero. Thank you. And we will come back to you as well with the audience questions a bit later. But now it's time to move back to Jyväskylä and uh, Chiara. Are you ready for us? Uh, we continue with taking the first reflections on the survey that you as webinar participants have been filling in. So over to you, Chiara, reflections on implications of the trust in media on communications professionals. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, so let's look already at the first question Do you have answered. How much do you trust information publishing in, in the news media? I think this is a very interesting result um, in the sense that also very uh, positive. As you can see, the majority, a very big chunk of answer, uh, trust the media. So it's in line with what we have seen on Mark and it's in line of, uh, of our uh, also finding uh, across the region. Um, when we look at, uh, for example, at um, factors so that make you think like you trust, why do you trust the media? What characteristic needs to have the media content to be trusted? Uh, also, this is quite interesting a result. The, the top three uh, most chosen um, answer are presence of balanced stories, um, objectivity and accuracy, which is also what uh, Eero has just presented you as important principle, part of the code of ethics of journalists. Fairness is not uh, so important uh, from your point of view, but accuracy it is important, um, and so objectivity. So I think this is quite uh, quite interesting. Uh, 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 first uh, preliminary result: uh, What are the the top top characteristic to trust what we read and hear in the news story? Um, when we ask also if the level, general level of media trust that uh, uh, is uh, perceived by the population where you live, where you work, um, uh, is affecting actual the effectiveness of media relation functions or, um, during your work activities. Um, also here, I think it's quite interesting result uh, because uh, we have a uh, uh, bit less than uh, one third of you uh, uh, answer not much, but of course there can be different reason for that. Some of you maybe don't work in media relations, so maybe <laughs> that also a reason uh, why uh, not very much. But uh, uh, two thirds will say yes, it does matter, and obviously it should matter. Uh, as uh, as a communicator, we also are uh, always in dialogue discussion with journalists uh, when we want to um, uh, create visibility to our organization, uh, inform about our organizational activities. Uh, so this is obviously uh, a good result in the sense that uh, at least uh, professional, we are clearly um, aware of the of the role of the media still today, despite the uh, increasing uh, use of uh, other channels, uh, own channels and uh, uh, social media influencers. Um, also, this uh, result is quite interesting. Uh, this, we ask you if you have uh, uh, tried to engage with the journalists and the news media organization to communicate uh, COVID related messages from your organization point of view. Um, uh, we have seen here also that a um, big group of you actually has done that. Obviously, you might be from a public sector organization, so from a non-profit organization where this is probably also a possible explanation of this result, but not necessarily. We did conduct a study actually, uh, which we didn't present today, but on business organizations and how they communicated uh, um, their uh, social responsibility, their social initiative during the pandemic. This is a different study, but we also uh, find out that uh, even in the six, same six countries I presented before, um, business organizations are actively engaging in uh, pandemic uh, uh, management uh, or support uh, um, to the government uh, um, authorities' activities. So it is obviously a clear indication that uh, when they do so, so media becomes an important uh, uh, um, stakeholder, an important uh, public to uh, interact with. Um, and uh, 
the last question we ask is that um, um, if different level of media trust uh, um, have actually had an, an impact in the in the, in your choices in your media choices, um, this has been is a bit more fragmented. Uh, again, here uh, some of you. Uh, mention that is actually important parameter when you decide uh, which media channel you want to use in communicating and uh, uh, some uh, had no clear opinions. Um, so this is also something obviously that uh, with this preliminary data we can't uh, um, know more in details the, the why this kind of splitting, uh, but uh, um, hopefully with, with more data we might uh, even link it to uh, geographic, um, your your organization, your industry, and geographic location where you base it and link it with uh, our data on uh, overall media trust. Um, I think was this was the last one, I believe. Um, yes, these are just more general data on the industry who answers so far. Uh, the 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 survey. So we are really looking forward to receive more uh, answer this uh, and to see how does this media trust affect your work and your activity and uh, and uh, uh, to reflect upon also with the general media trust trend. I think I will stop here and see rather if there are some questions about this, some results. Um, and start a discussion about the learning for professional with my colleagues in the studio. Thank you, Kiara, and, and uh, exactly now it is time for your questions. So thank you already for those that you have sent to us. And I will also invite Eero to join here and, and give some room for him. And I will step aside and, and put the questions forward for you. And by the way, <coughs> we didn't show the slide where 60% of our participants have 10 or more years of experience. So we have a very experienced audience. <laughs> Absolutely. We will come back uh, definitely with more details, more insights when interpreting uh, this pre-study. Thank you for participating in it. But uh, let's start with the audience questions. So one question regarding the, the trust and um, trust in media. Are we in communications partly responsible for the declining media trust, for instance, due to our PR spin towards media? What would you say, <laughs> Mark? I think we have to take some responsibility, yes. Um, it's easy to point the finger at journalists, but <laughs> we have to take some responsibility because we have, a, we have a certain reputation in public relations, especially for spin. And so, uh, uh, whilst we are fighting for our own corporations, our own organizations to get our point of view across and we have a lot of competing opinions and we have to fight for our opinion to get through all the noise of news media, uh, we do tend to spin a little bit and so that has caused some repercussions, our reputation has been somewhat damaged and so that has been reflected in the news media but we should share some responsibility for that I think. What about there, or do you want to comment on the same? Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's ha that has been the case actually. Also, we have we have issued some reprimands because of that. Uh, I think it's 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 very good that we uh, we can handle openly this kind of problems, and also the the point that uh, at least I think in in many other countries, but also in, in Finland, that there, there, there are ethical codes for for communicators as well. Mm, yeah. Very good. Yeah. If yeah. can I add a something? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I think this problem of um, responsibility also should be broadening up because of course uh, <clears throat> um, PR and communication professionals are in the front line. They interact with journalists. They are the one who um, through the careful usage of the wording and communication can persuade, but uh, we have always to remember that uh, uh, much of what we communicate is a more collective decision of the senior management in an organization. So um, obviously it's a big task for us communicator to make clear to our uh, senior manager organization that that kind of message cannot go off because it's not it's going to produce uh, 
uh, more negative effects uh, than positive ones. And so, so um, it's not just the evil communication professional that is spinning and manipulating information. Uh, if he or she does that, uh, of course, there is a team of people who are trying to say, we need to look better here in the news. We need to <laughs> send our message. You have to convince the people about us. So <laughs> there is a, a lot of to discuss about, I think, or responsibility and accountability of, of, of what is going out of organizations, yes, yes. even in political organizations. Yes, yes. And, and Errol mentioned journalists have their uh, code of ethics <laughs> and we do too in our industry in different countries, wherever you are, we have our own code of ethics too and we should be constantly looking back at those and making sure we abide by those. Very good. Uh, you partly touched upon this, but I will ask it anyhow. So what can uh, communications professionals do about the de declining media trust? Yeah, well, we, this ties very much into what we were saying, is, isn't it? That uh, um, I think we need to join our associations wherever they are. In, a, in, in Finland, there is the PROCOM, the Association of Professional Communication, uh, well, Association of Communication Professionals. And then in, I know in Australia, where I'm originally from, there's the Public Relations Institute of Australia. All around the world, we, we should be getting more involved in these associations so that we collectively uh, adopt more communication ethics. Um, this is something that I don't need to remind you of. It's been drummed into us, but we need to make sure that we, we, we've got a long way still to go. And uh, by joining and getting involved in these discussions with our associations, we can, I think we can do a better job. Eero, I'm, I'm turning to you with the next one. So if media trust is high, is it easier for communications people to work with journalists? This is very interesting result. Can we draw a conclusion? In Finland, there are less classical problems to work with journalists than, for example, in France. Mm, a mm. good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not so familiar with, with the French media that I could uh, answer. Uh, but I think and I hope uh, that, uh, that when the relationship is, is uh, functioning uh, well, then, then each of us know the rules and uh, live by them. And maybe, maybe if that's the question. If, if, if it's a question of that kind of situation, maybe then it's easier to live in Finland. But I don't know. I don't know the French system quite well. Mm. I know some French people and they are quite, uh, <laughs> how, how would I say, uh, they are qu uh, quite, uh, uh, quite used to demonstrating. And, and maybe, maybe that, that kind of mentality is lower here in Finland. Mm. What about Martin? Yeah, the, uh, we, we teach in universities in public relations courses that um, it comes down to the relationship between communication professionals or like media relations professionals and journalists and editors and producers and so on. That relationship is really important. It's a, uh, it, it, there is some conflict because we want different things, but it is still essentially a relationship, a professional relationship. And so I guess I would ask, in Finland, how is that going? You would get, do you get a sense that communication professionals in Finland generally have a good relationship with journalists or uh, there's some tensions? It, it has improved. Uh, there are tensions. Mm. There are tensions and there are journalists who, who think uh, of uh, communication professionals as their enemies. Mm -hmm. uh, there are still people, but I think it's, it's, it has improved. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Some countries it would be worse than others, but I, I yeah. would expect Finland yeah. being, w would be quite high. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Tiara? Do you want to comment from your yeah. perspective? Yeah, I, I think one point uh, I would like to add to this is that uh, <clears throat> unfortunately there are still a lot of uh, uh, <clears throat> pseudo professional who uh, say they do communication and PR and do bad job and they damage the reputation of the communication professionals. So it's particularly important also as a um, professional who follow the code of conduct, who have uh, uh, been trained to do the proper PR, also to be explicit and to tell to our clients, uh, to our journalists, to make sure that uh, people understand that we are not the one who is just doing some uh, something with communication <laughs> without actually 
uh, taking in consideration this code. So it's very important uh, to also do, I would like to use this word self-branding the profession to make sure that uh, those who we encounter understand that they are interacting with us and we are, if not certified, but we have been going through the proper training, we are the qualified ones and not they are not getting services from someone or pseudo communication person who might da, da, uh, do more damage than, than, than good things to the organization. And this is something that unfortunately uh, it varies across countries that so we uh, we've seen uh, in other studies um, um, also available through the global alliances that this uh, um, certification, these qualifications are very different in different countries uh, and uh, the, the communication profession unfortunately is still one that uh, sometimes is taken over by known um, communica real communication communicators so, so that's also an issue that uh, undermine uh, the relationship and the building of trust, of course, between uh, the um, journalists and communication professionals. Yeah, and that's another reason why we should be make, trying to make sure that um, our associations, our professional associations of communication professionals around the world, in each country, tr try to make sure that um, that you join up, um, because then we we have professional development and codes of ethics that it <clears throat> we make sure that they are applied and that people are following them and uh, I guess that's the same with the journalists that there are pseudo journalists and I guess you guys would also want to make sure that they all come under an umbrella of professional associations and code yeah, of ethics. Uh, journalism is an uh, open profession in, in Finland. Yeah okay. Yeah. Mm. Very good we take a next question here has there been any similar kind of phenomenon other than COVID-19 that has affected communication, media and media trust accordingly? For instance, during last decades, are there any benchmarks for the COVID situation? Well, Chiara, I think mentioned this uh, and you also defended journalists when we talked about this collaborative role of news media that there are communication or mass communication scholars who have said that during times of war, that the news media organizations, journalists, uh, should, should be collaborating. And they, there is evidence that they have in wartime collaborated with the authorities, with their own gov national governments. Yeah, but they also were forced to co uh, cooperate. Are they? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there was censorship and stuff Yes, because like yeah. I noticed you pushed yeah. back on that, which yeah. is fair enough. And yeah. we would expect the journalists yeah. to push back on yeah. that, that you are independent yeah. of influence. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, we we haven't been uh, cl even close to that kind of situation we were, or people living back then mm. during the Second World War. Happily, we have haven't been close to that kind of situation with mm. the COVID mm. crisis. Uh, I I would say that uh, as as for trustworthy news, maybe you, you can you can say easily that. Climate change has been debated as much as, as COVID, and, and, and very similar kind of uh, grounds have been used in this debate. Mm. Uh, very good. Uh, let's move on. So we have time. A couple of more questions. So uh, media are never independent because people are writing the articles and they always have an opinion. Isn't it more about making the right judgment on both ends? the communications professional and the journalist during the times of crisis, not a matter of a, a balancing act with a question mark. Wow. Mm, yes. Can I take this question? Go ahead, Chiara, please. Yes, this is a super right comment. So I think that's exactly what it is about it. Um, in times of crisis and like this, uh, um, of course, so the, the citizen can make their own opinion based on, on, on what is said and, and, and a different perspective and, and, and uh, that they are presented there. So the, the diversity of opinions is actually an important element to judge uh, who said what and what is the purpose of saying that. So the citizen can make judge that. However, in our um, study, we found that this kind of uh, particular situation where the crisis is created by the novel disease. I mean, remember, we didn't know much about uh, 
this uh, um, COVID-19 uh, disease. Uh, uh, now we know more than a year ago, but still it's not like a complete set of knowledge. So when people have uh, really um, low knowledge on the disease, to judge the different opinions on the topic, or maybe they get the knowledge, but they do not have the expertise to say, uh, to ponder, to weigh to the, the, these opinions, uh, they need to trust someone. They need to trust the assessment of someone. And that's where comes media trust is very important. If, if the people trust the media, do their job uh, properly, uh, then they trust also what they read and this assessment of the different opinions out there. Uh, if trust in the media is low and then there is a lot of different opinions, they might start wondering which one is the right uh, direction. Should we do this or that? Mm -hmm. Who is right? Who is wrong in this conversation of COVID-19? And, and this is what is happening. I would say now we have not, we're still collecting data, but I think now with the vaccination, it's a similar kind of discussion. Uh, who is right? Who is wrong about uh, these vaccines and, and the prevention they can offer us? Uh, we don't have sufficient knowledge uh, to make um, a, a true 100% uh, conf with confidence uh, decision on that. Uh, and we need to trust someone. We need to trust, give trust, confidence to someone who has more expertise uh, and has uh, uh, more inside knowledge on these new diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, so so the, the diversity of opinions uh, uh, might actually turn uh, um, things uh, a bit more uh, um, difficult for, I mean, might create more confusion at the end than actually helping people making sense of the best practices. Yeah, but can I just say related to this question about diversity of opinion, I think that uh, media trust has been problematic partly because I think in the news there is not much clear distinction in some countries between opinion exactly. and yeah. news, you're, right? You're definitely right. Yeah, right? yeah, and it's it's very difficult for the audience to uh, to to find out the difference between yeah. different kind of genres. Yeah, they they don't recognize the different kind of genres. That's right. It is a genre. Yeah. So, yeah. particularly in the U.S., yeah. we are familiar with uh, CNN, Fox News. They have opinion and comment genres mm -hmm. and then they have the hard news genres and that sometimes gets a bit blurred exactly very good there's a very precise question uh, maybe Chiara you can start with this so content diversity and trust do not correlate in some countries did I get this right how would you read it another remark knowledge uncertainty was low in Sweden although Sweden has had poor success during COVID crisis? Yes. Um, so this is actually uh, <clears throat> very interesting. Uh, they are a little bit interesting result because they are very different. I think the Swedish case is a particular case where we have seen that during the pandemic, also what we call it more societal type of trust, trust in the fellow citizen, has increased uh, despite the fact that the government had, uh, particularly during the first year, had a very different approach, let's say, in in the management of COVID. Or let's say they 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 um, had uh, uh, the liberty chosen to uh, um, to look for herd immunity. Um, this, uh, despite these things, so despite the, the the assessment on on the government, the trust on the media is higher and on the fellow citizens was higher. So this what tell us, it tells that the trust is a very complex mechanism. And uh, um, uh, in a time of a pandemic like this, um, it's not just uh, um, trusting the media or trusting the government or trusting uh, health authorities. It's a combination of different levels of trust that together help uh, um, people confidence uh, on coping. Um, because uh, we receive information not just through the news media, we might uh, uh, directly from the government, health authority, or even through other channels or through direct contact with, uh, I don't know, um, um, health uh, uh, personnel like doctors, uh, nurses, and, and those working in, 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 in the first line. So uh, I think this could be explained in that terms that uh, the Swedes uh, had low uh, mm, knowledge and certainty, meaning they were feeling comfortable to cope in despite the fact uh, uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the 
the diversity of sources and the government choices were different because of this other form of trust. As for the first question related to uh, sorry, remind me, was about uh, media trust and diversity in content. Yes. Normally, we would say yes, there is direct correlation between source diversity and news credibility. So we normally would say uh, media gain credibility when they cover different kinds of sources, different kind of content, different kind of opinions. Uh, however, this, uh, this is still valid during the pandemic, but we are seeing that this is not helping the coping mechanism because in some countries, uh, citizens have uh, um, to feel uh, more stressed and more uh, confused by the quantity of information, by the different opinions out there. Mm. I hope I answered the questions. <laughs> <coughs> thank, <coughs> thank you, Chiara. <coughs> thank you so much. And I guess it's time for us to round up this interesting discussion here today. So a huge thank you to our presenters, uh, our online audience, and let's continue the dialogue on ethics in communications in the social media and in the different events during the, the ethics month. And I will use this opportunity to remind you of a couple of those we have in pipeline for you. So on February 10th, we will be broadcasting about artificial intelligence, communications and ethics the challenges and opportunities. Please register and, and join us online there. Uh, following week, February 15th, trust me, I'm in PR. How to work with your organization to build relationship that improves reputation, earns confidence, and maybe, just maybe, leads to trust. So a lot of good events, uh, join the dialogue. Co let's continue the discussion in the social media channels by using the hashtags Ethics Matter and Ethics Month. Thank you for joining us here today. Have a great day and have a great February Ethics Month.